You have alimony awards in marital relationships when people are married. You cannot have them in palimony actions. In a divorce, you also have, in addition to alimony, equitable distribution of property and council fee awards. These two are not re allowed in palimony actions. So there's no equitable distribution, there's no alimony, and there's no council fees. What is the remedy? The court is limited to providing a lump sum to the party seeking enforcement in an amount predicated upon the present value of the reasonable future support the defendant promised to provide. So the court... Th that sounds a little like equitable distribution. It's not actually. What they do is they look at the amount of services being provided by the dependent party, and they look at that dependent party's life expectancy. And essentially what they're doing with alimony is making it a lump sum. They can't award alimony. They're awarding support, but instead of it being over a term of years, which is typical in an alimony award, it's paid in a lump sum. They present value it. So, for example, if a court determined that the supporting spouse was entitled to $50,000 a year in support, they would factor in the life expectancy and then present value, the $50,000. let us compare, since you brought it up, palimony versus alimony for a moment. We all are familiar that when a marriage is dissolved, if there's a short-term marriage, generally the alimony, if it's applicable, is maybe a, over a short period of time. As the marriage had matured and was considered maybe a long-term marriage, and we're using generic terms because we don't want to get into the definitions uh, of, of the terms, but generally alimony would be paid over a longer period of time if the marriage was longer. How does this concept relate to palimony? Well, unlike alimony, uh, and in New Jersey we have three types of alimony, which is also... Uh, by law and by statute, we have um, actually four, rehabilitative alimony, reimbursement alimony, limited duration, and permanent. And there's various factors that go into all of those awards. You don't have the ability to award any of that alimony to a dependent person in a palimony action. Um, it is also not included in their income, as alimony is, and it's not deductible to the person paying it. The difference is that in an alimony action, as you are aware also, alimony terminates upon the death of either party or upon the supporting spouse's remarriage. In palimony, it's much different because it's clearly based on what that party is entitled to receive, and I'm going to liken it to an alimony award because the court determines based upon uh, the lifestyles of the par parties, all the factors that are used in an alimony award, lifestyle and ability to pay and income, what they then do is they present value it and they pay it in a lump sum. So you don't have it terminating upon death. You don't have it terminating if the dependent party remarries. You don't have the ability to modify if the person paying should have a substantial change in circumstance, or for that matter, if the dependent party has a substantial change in circumstance. So all of those abilities or factors that are common in an alimony claim or in a divorce are not part of the palimony claim. Some people believe that to some extent there is some unjust enrichment because this supporting a spouse is now obligated to pay more to the dependent spouse than he might have been obligated to pay had he been married. What if the companion who is now required to pay this palimony amount doesn't have these funds? Well, the court orders it in a lump sum. And then if the party being ordered to pay the money doesn't have the ability to pay the lump sum, the court can order a payout schedule. But it really is, in a palimony action, it's really a combination of alimony slash equitable distribution. That's really what it is. And that's not a legal analysis, but I liken it to that analysis because equitable distribution in New Jersey is non-modifiable. You pay equitable distribution uh, based upon your assets and, and uh, the length of the marriage, the court determines the distribution of, of assets. 
In a palimony action, there are no assets. There are no equitable distribution. There is no equitable distribution, I should say. And there is no division of the assets unless those assets were owned jointly during the relationship, which in most cases they're not. So if there's a home and the home is titled in the supporting spouse's name and the dependent spouse can't prove that the supporting spouse was going to provide her with a home or him with a home, in that case, there's no distribution of that property. So as a result of that, the lump sum, I believe, takes into consideration that there is no equitable distribution. So as in Kozlowski, where you had a 15-year relationship, you have this lump sum being paid to this person for the services, not only prospectively, but retrospectively, you know, looking at what this person provided to the supporting spouse over those years. Does the court look at each party's representation of lifestyle to help determine this amount? Yes. So it may not necessarily be based upon income. It may not be based, based, based upon available cash, but certainly lifestyle. What, what if, in fact, the lifestyle was created by borrowing or incurring credit card debt? Is the same thought process used here in the palimony amount as if, if we can liken it to an alimony situation? There are similarities. I don't believe the same factors are used exclusively in a palimony action. As I said, it is a lump sum payment, so courts are careful in how they fashion that amount. Um, But they do look at the factors, which include how the parties lived and how the dependent person was being supported by the other party. You're obviously very fluent in, the, in this subject area. So let's continue to use this broadcast as a tool for other attorneys and a practice aid. What do you think a palimony action should contain in regards to its complaint or maybe even an answer? What kind of tips can you give your, your fellow attorneys to help them facilitate either the ap- application or the objection of a palimony claim? Well, unfortunately, at this point, unless they have a written agreement or unless our our, uh, judicial system interprets the uh, legislation differently, without a written agreement, there is a strong possibility that the palimony complaint is going to be dismissed. However, should the court find that the legislature did not intend for this statute to apply to palimony actions that came about prior to the legislation, i.e. the parties began living together at any time prior to January 1st, 2010, then I think the essentials have to be that the parties were involved in a marital-type relationship, that there was an express or implied contract or agreement between the parties that the dependent spouse would be supported by the supporting spouse. Those are essentials in any complaint. To a layman, that sounds a little bit like a prenuptial agreement. It does. It does. Um, The prenuptial statute actually has a lot more factors in it than the palimony statute. The palimony statute, very simple, very plain, has to be a written agreement. The agreement can be executed either during the uh, period of time the parties live together or at the termination of the relationship, and you have to have independent legal advice. That's it. The prenuptial statute is a little more intense, requires full and complete financial disclosure or a waiver of that disclosure in order for it to be held to be a valid prenuptial agreement. It can't leave one party destitute or as a public charge. It can't leave one party in a uh, lifestyle less or lower than the lifestyle that person lived in prior to the prenuptial agreement being executed. So it's a little more detailed than the palimony uh, statute. But I do think that there will be similarities in whether or not a palimony agreement is upheld in the future. Simply because you have a written agreement 
And quite frankly, I don't know of any palimony action in the state of New Jersey or honestly in any state that was brought because the parties had a written agreement. However, going forward, if people do enter into these written agreements, it doesn't mean that they're automatically going to be upheld. I think it's still a contract and the court will still have the ability to invalidate an agreement based upon a number of factors. If the agreement, like any contract, is unconscionable, if it's void against public policy, there are a number of reasons why an agreement may be held to be invalid in the future. But simply because it's written between these two parties and they both had counsel doesn't automatically mean it's going to be upheld in the future. Do you think that the palimony issue is going to be as prevalent in couples that were considered affluent as compared to couples that maybe live in, to use the term, an ordinary lifestyle? Do you think there's going to be any clash of the classes here in regards to the application of, of the uh, palimony actions? I definitely believe that this statute is going to negatively affect lower income women in general, because these are typically the women who come before the court seeking palimony relief, women who are not necessarily educated, who have very little financial means, who have given services, i.e. taking care of homes and children, taking care of the supporting party for many years, who are now really in jeopardy of becoming destitute, just like the case where the woman was locked out of her home. Because if that woman came to court today, she wouldn't have a home. You're going to be left with women who have very little education, very little financial means, essentially being homeless and destitute. So I, I think that's where the courts are going to come in with other remedies. And as I said before, these remedies could be quantum merit, you know, other contract remedies to skirt the palimony statute. And, and we'll see what happens because affluent people are going to know about this law. Non-affluent people, and let's face it, these are mostly women who may not speak English, may not have a great deal of education. They're not going to know about the palimony statute. They're in a relationship they've relied upon to their detriment, this relationship and this promise to be supported, and those are the women who are going to suffer. All right. Well, Stephanie, thank you very much for joining us today. It's a terrific discussion about this issue and certainly very timely. Our guest today has been attorney Stephanie Hagen of Donahue, Hagen, Klein, Newsom, and O'Donnell. If you have any questions on family law matters, I'm sure Stephanie will be happy to assist you. You can reach her at her Morristown offices. Her phone number is area code 973-467-5556. As always, our audience is welcome to contact our office with any questions or comments. Don't forget to stay tuned with us on the web at www.msgcpa.com, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter, Forensic Perspectives. We can also be found on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and of course by phone. Your topic suggestions for future broadcasts are always welcome. Until our next program, this is Mark Gottlieb. Thank you for joining us. You have just enjoyed another episode of Forensic Perspectives, hosted by financial expert Mark Gottlieb. For questions and or comments regarding this broadcast, please feel free to contact Mark by phone at 516-829-4936 or via email at msgcpa at msgcpa.com. We also encourage you to visit our website, www.msgcpa.com. The opinions and commentary in the preceding program provided by our host and guests are for informational and educational purposes only and may not be their personal or professional opinion. No accounting, tax, or legal advice is being provided. The information provided within this broadcast is not an invitation for an attorney-client or accountant-client relationship. One should always seek the advice of competent professionals to assist in their specific needs. 
In addition, this podcast will not be updated for changes in accounting practices or law. As such, one should not rely on any information provided by this podcast. References to resources are provided solely for the listener's convenience. We have not reviewed or verified any information, advertising, products, resources, or other materials mentioned herein. This broadcast is copyright of Mark S. Gottlieb, CPA PC, all rights reserved. Any redistribution or reproduction of part or all of this broadcast is strictly prohibited unless authorized in writing.